Welcome to NJ Law, the program designed to inform and educate you about the inner workings of our criminal justice system, allowing you to speak directly to New Jersey law enforcement officials who make the decisions in our two-county area. Your host, Detective Sergeant Kevin Quinn of the Township of Ocean Police Department, is an 11-year veteran police officer. He has taught at the Monmouth County Police Academy and has lectured at Monmouth College and Brookdale College. Sergeant Kevin Quinn from the Township of Ocean Police and uh, welcome to our NJ Law Show for December 20th, 1990. Uh, this is basically our Christmas show uh, since Christmas is in a couple of days and we have some important topics to discuss that have to do with winter uh, safety and also ice safety. Before I get to my guests, uh, we'd like to dedicate this show. We spoke about this before the show. Uh, we'd like to dedicate this show to the memory of Howard Rowland. Uh, who died a couple of years ago and was a, a good friend and a, a teacher to uh, all three of us that are here. Um, got us pretty much involved in diving and um, was a help to not only ourselves but uh, everyone along the shore uh, who had anything to do with the water. Our number here at the studio is 681-3330. That's 681-3330. If you have any questions about what we're discussing or any law enforcement related questions that we might be able to answer, please give us a call. If we don't know the answers, we'll certainly try to find out for you uh, and hopefully uh, the subject uh, on winter that we're speaking about you'll be interested in and might have some questions for my guests. And to get to them, to my immediate left is uh, Patrolman Eric Rice of the Howell Township Police Department. He's also uh, engaged uh, or involved in the Fairview First Aid up in Middletown. And to his left is uh, Sergeant Dana Parcells of the uh, Township of Ocean Police, uh, who happens to be my partner in the police department there, and uh, who's the commander of their underwater search and recovery team. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you for taking time to come down, especially uh, I know you have a lot of Christmas shopping to do, and uh, you took time out to come down, so I appreciate it. Um, Dana, I want to start with you and ask a question. I think uh, some of the viewers at home may or may not understand what underwater search and recovery is about. And uh, Ocean Township, I believe, is one of the first departments in the area to have such a team. So maybe you could explain how it came about. Okay. Uh, search and recovery is basically the recovering of objects, bodies, evidence underwater, utilizing techniques of uh, salvage scuba or nowadays hard hat diving. Back in 1973 when I joined the department the team was already in effect and uh, we brought it up from a um, local team and would utilize throughout the state in the 70s and we were funded by the fire department and the first aids and we had uh, shore party which helped us with getting dressed uh, organizing our search patterns and handling our lines to uh, supplement the manpower. And then uh, through the 80s, um, the team was utilized for mostly body recovery, uh, drowning victims, and uh, once under the ice and once uh, out of a car or submerged in a lake. Well, um what I wanted to mention, and, and I, uh, you may be a little uh, too modest to mention it yourself, you were decorated twice that I know of in, uh, in our police department for saving two separate people. One, uh, a young boy who was uh, under the ice for a considerable amount of time who was brought, brought back at the hospital, which I'd like to speak about in a little bit, and Eric, maybe we can talk about that too. Uh, and also um, an elderly couple uh, that I remember from back in, uh, I believe that was 82? Um, yes, it was. Two's car plummeted into the lake behind our food town store. Um, so certainly uh, you have a lot of experience in that area. Uh, you've even utilized that experience beyond the police realm, and, and I believe you have a, uh, uh, a business on the side where you do types of recoveries that wouldn't necessarily have to do with rescues, but maybe uh, helping people out with boats and things, correct? Yes, yeah, my wife and I have a small business. Okay. Um, Eric, how about, uh, how about up in Fairview and in Howell? Uh, I know you've been uh, for a long time involved in uh, Fairview Rescue Squad. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and then tell us what's happening in, uh, in the Howell Township Police Department now. Well, Fairview's had a dive team 
since about 1965 and been ongoing since then. I've been a member of the team since 72. And uh, now we're starting a team in Howell Township with the Office of Emergency Management using uh, the police officers who are currently certified as divers to start the team. And uh, we've been getting monies from donations from the public and from some of the fire companies uh, that are in the area. But the reservoir is uh, a large one, covers about 740 acres, it's about 40 five feet deep in the center and it's certainly in a prime location, very beautiful reservoir, so it's going to attract a lot of people and for that concern, the OEM and the police and fire and first aids have developed a plan and we've set up a dive team that is uh, just started this year. Let's talk about that just for a second. Uh, the reservoir has been uh, in the news and when they opened it last year and such. What? Uh, Where's it located, first of all, and and what kind of uses are they going to have? They're going to have a lot of recreational use. The plan is for quite a bit of recreation. They have uh, two boat ramps that uh, come in off Windler Road. Uh, they do have jogging trails. They hope to put in uh, picnic areas. Um, the county has uh, uh, a lot of plans for other recreational activities. Of course, budget's a problem, but. Uh, they have, a, I, I believe, somewhere is about a five-year growth plan for that uh, area. So we, they hope to have it heavily utilized. Now, this is uh, the, the proper name for it is the Manasquan Reservoir. Manasquan River Reservoir. But it's actually it's located within Howell Township. In Howell Township, Town? correct. Uh, whereabouts? Uh, it uh, is surrounded by Georgia Tavern Road, mm -hmm. by uh, Peskin Road, Manassas, Old Tavern, and uh, Windler. Okay, is that up by the where the Matitaconk uh, area? Or? No, it'll be just uh, east of uh, Highway Nine, uh, in the okay. area of the interstate, Interstate One Ninety Five. And it'll certainly be accessible to a lot of people from not only in the area but outside the oh, area for very easily those so. kind of uses. Cool. Um, you anticipate people trying to ice skate on this thing? Uh, yeah, we'd have to. Um, the park system is considering whether they're going to open up a a skating area, certainly not this year, mm -hmm. but uh, you know there's a lot of problems with the ice and being able to manage it and make sure the ice is safe and liability wise and being able to control the crowds that will come in. So that's certainly a concern and whether they decide to open it for ice skating and winter recreational activities is unknown, mm -hmm. but uh, that's certainly a possibility and the other thing is the obvious is people get on without authorization and it's certainly uh, a very big attraction for people to come in and try to get on, you know, s yeah. swimming after hours, ice skating when it's not authorized and other kind of activities. So it'll present a safety hazard for all of us. Now, w what I'm hearing is that the, the county, you're, you're talking about the county, I guess, is county park system is going to monitor this reservoir yeah. as, a, as a park type area? That's correct. Okay. And they have a resident ranger um, who has a, a house right on the grounds. So they will be uh, patrolling the area and be the, on the grounds all the time. And the first responding agency to any any situation there. Um, Dana and Ocean, uh, just you know, to review maybe for the people who may not or may or may not be from that area, we, we certainly have enough water around. Um, maybe you could uh, talk about some of the different water areas as far as uh, uh, water conditions. We have Deal Lake, which. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we have the three branches of Deal Lake, um, West Allenhurst, Wanamassa, and then a separate branch on the west side of Wickapecka Road, which is actually the deepest part of the lake. And we have a little brook uh, pond behind the houses over on uh, Mammoth Road mm -hmm. in the Oakhurst section uh -huh. where they skate a lot. And it's deep enough that somebody could get trapped underneath the ice. And there's one area that uh, I think last year we actually didn't really trip upon. We knew it was there, but we didn't realize people had been skating out there off, out off a of roller road in the uh, area by um, Faith Drive. That's I don't I don't know how deep that is, but uh, I know there's some people been out there. Um, and I've noticed some new problems, or I don't know if there'll be problem areas. There's, they've been using retention ponds. On the west side of 18, right at the border of, I guess, us and Eatontown or Tinton Falls, um, 
that seem to be areas. And um, just a reminder to viewers, what, we're, what we want to talk about is um, ice safety um, and also first aid issues uh, having to do with winter. And we're going to, later on in the show, we're going to have a, a slide presentation that uh, both uh, Dana and Eric had made up. Uh, and we'll discuss some of those safety issues uh, um, a lot more in detail. Right now, we're just going to skip over a lot of them. Uh, in uh, you guys have also went down, uh, been diving in the ocean because uh, although Ocean Township called Ocean Township doesn't really actually touch the ocean anymore, um, and you've been utilized by uh, other agencies for uh, crime investigation type diving, correct? Yes, uh, the FBI. Monmouth County and quite a few of the local police departments. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the most famous cases I can recall right off the top of my head uh, has to do with uh, some diving up in Keensburg, I believe. Maybe you could tell us a tiny bit about that. That was uh, the CBS murder case where the convicted perpetrator, Donald Nash, uh, gunned down the people up on the pier parking area. He lived in Keensburg. Uh, the FBI set up a surveillance, followed him back to his Keensburg house, which the back uh, yard bordered on the Tidal Creek back there. When they decided to search the premise, the FBI's dive team was in its fledgling state, and they asked us if we would come in and join up with their team to assist in the searching for evidence and or any bodies that might be in the creek. Uh, we spent two days up there executing the search warrant while they hit the house. We were in the water and we located I think 11 22 caliber uh, shells which were the same shells, the extractor marks matched the same shells found on the, on the pier that did the murders. And we found quite a bit of evidence, uh, license plates that were used in a pirating, pirating uh, cab scheme that they had up there, and um, some of the paint they used to camouflage the van when they took it to Kentucky. Uh, the credit card receipts from where he bought the ammunition, and uh, this was a while ago, I forget the total number of pieces but we went up and testified in the Superior Court in New York uh, for recovering that evidence. So certainly uh, the use of these underwater dive teams doesn't just have to do with the winter or when it's icy. Or it also has to do with uh, the summer months, especially every once in a while. Uh, unfortunately, a swimmer is lost out in the ocean and, uh, and somebody has to uh, do the recovery, which is uh, a less than pleasant task. But um, you guys have shown an interest in doing that. Eric, you have a strong background in, um, in first aid, I know. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we used to teach up at the Red Cross together, didn't we? Yes, we did. Um, and I think that uh, it maybe it would be a good idea if, if we talk before we get to the, the part about ice and ice rescues, if we talked a little bit about some of the safety uh, concerns of, of all people that are around. Uh, having to do with uh, the winter. First of all, uh, even driving, uh, people, people always forget uh, that in the first snowfall and they're not prepared and so everybody's running for chains and, and things like that. I don't know if you have any happening driving tips uh, at the tip of your, uh, tip of your tongue. Um, the ones I was thinking of is that the people have the proper uh, tires on their vehicle when, when the snow starts coming, that they uh, prepare somewhat. Sometimes if the snow's heavy enough, they might want to weigh the trunk a little bit. But um, you hear out in the Midwest of these people getting lost in snow drifts for months and months and months and them finding them uh, all frozen. And is, are there anything, is there something that people can do to protect themselves, let's say, for some chance they're coming down a parkway and they, uh, it, it, there's uh, a heavy snow and they slide off into a snow bank and they don't think anybody saw them. Do you know of anything that they could do to protect themselves? Well, the first thing is to have some kind of a flag, uh, bright orange, similar to uh, what the bicyclists use, so that's uh, readily seen by other motorists. And uh, the other thing is try 
do the best you can to keep warm and find some kind of shelter either within the car. Um, additional blankets should be left in the car, uh, not necessarily in the trunk because it may become inaccessible if you're into a snowbank and can't get out of the vehicle. But the um, main thing is to make yourself visible to other motorists and certainly the bicycle flag is a, a very good item to use. If you have CB radios, uh, portable radios that they have now that you can plug into your lighter, uh, many of the area police departments and the state police monitor the emergency channel. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, an idea. And the third is just do whatever you can to limit your exercise and maintain body heat. Uh, which would be handy if someone else was in a car with you. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Not so much if you're alone. Um, uh, one of the things that maybe we should remind the people too is uh, unless they know that the back of their car is exposed as far as snow packed around the exhaust that they not keep the vehicle running. Sure. Um, or at least make sure they keep some of the windows open even though that might be uncomfortable if they're blowing the heat so that the carbon monoxide doesn't um, back up into the car and which can be deceptive because the cold and the carbon monoxide are almost going to have the same effect of making people uh, terribly drowsy. Yes. Make them drowsy initially to make them kind of high or a euphoria and uh, they at that time do not feel that anything is wrong and certainly their consciousness starts to wane and when the time they realize there's a problem it's too late to do anything about it. Um, also, I mean, if people are going out and uh, even walking their dog or uh, the kid's gone out to play and, and mom wants to make sure that they're properly clothed, um, the uh, the biggest, heaviest things sometimes isn't necessarily the best. Maybe we could even talk about that. True. Uh, you're better off using uh, layered clothing. Um, three and four layers of lighter clothing certainly uh, better for them. It traps air acts as an insulator, maintains heat better that way as opposed to one big bulky garment. And uh, for ice situations and people, skaters who fall through, that kind of layered clothing, since it traps a lot of air, will help keep them afloat and keep them above the uh, ice level. So uh, it has a safety factor besides maintaining body heat also. Well, that's, and that's excellent to know because I think people would think almost the opposite. You know, if you have a lot of clothing, it's going to drag you down real fast and, and you're going to be like an anchor. And uh, that's not necessarily true as long as you uh, do the layer of clothing. Instead. That's correct. Let me just pause for a second. I think we have a call here. Good evening. You're on NJ Law. Would you give us your name and your question, please? Yes. My name is Mark. Yes. And uh, I'd like to say, uh, first of all, I think you guys are doing a great, great job. All right. Uh, and second of all, I would like to say that uh, Rachel Law Okay. Thank you for your first comment, Mark. The second one kind of got lost in the uh, in the shuffle there. Um, as we were saying about falling through the ice, and I want to get to that in a second with Dana, um, there's some basic tips uh, also, especially for the youngsters, about uh, things like sledding, which sound like they're very common sense, but most rules that, uh, that we discuss are basically common sense. Um, obviously, you don't want to go sledding on a hill that leads out into a main roadway uh, because that could certainly be a problem and, and unfortunately we have far too many children injured every year from uh, accidents that have to do with uh, vehicles and uh, accident on a sled that certainly doesn't have any brakes on it. Um, the, uh, the other thing is sledding between parked cars. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other... Uh, Being towed by vehicles. Sledders being towed and by that's vehicles. a biggie. A lot of kids, every year we have uh, problems with kids doing that. Um, and I, I'm trying to think if we're, Dana, do you know if we've had any injuries related to that? I don't think so, but we always get a couple of calls about it. Doesn't um, come to mind, no. Um, we always get calls. I'm sure you do down at Howell. <coughs> it's everybody trucking down the road, hanging on the bumper of a car, which works real well, but the car can probably stop faster than the sled and they slide underneath it. Um, let me think. Daniel, let me ask you this. It, I'm driving down a street and for some reason, there's a patch of ice or whatever, I lose control of my car and I end up in a drink. It goes out in the ice and breaks through. I mean, 
it, is there something I can do that's gonna, you know, right now I can't open the doors because the car isn't full of water and everything. You know, what's what can I do to increase my chances of survival? Well, the first thing and most obvious and probably the hardest is to maintain your composure. Panic is going to create uh, almost certain death. Wait till the car fills up with water if you can't get the doors open. The pressure inside is going to be uh, higher than the pressure outside. And until that pressure equalizes, then it'll be easier to open up the doors. Uh, the weight of water is, is far greater than the weight of air. So mm. trying to push against the weight of that water uh, is going to be impossible for most people. So once the car fills up, you can hold your breath and then get that door open easier and then go to the surface. Uh, but the panic of trying to break windows, uh, wedge the door open, is only going to use up oxygen, one, and two, it's going to possibly put you in a, a situation that you can't get free of once you are underwater and full of... Uh, now, if I, uh, if I roll down the windows, is that going to help me any uh, as far as Hopefully, if I don't have electric windows, well, they might operate anyway. But if I uh, if I rolled, should I roll down the windows and try to do it that way and squeeze through that window opening, or or do you think it's it's good to uh, wait for the um, wait for that water to fill up, or even roll a window down to facilitate the, it opening up, and then you can open the door. Yeah, if you can get the window open, of course, get out right away. Uh, this is in the instance where the window is jammed from mm -hmm. the impact or the electric locks don't work properly or you can't find the right button. Uh, but do the best you can to get out before the car does go under because in those instances there's no guarantees that you're going to keep your faculties. Uh, when the cold water hits your eardrums, there's a good chance uh, vertigo will set in and you won't know where you are or even what's up or that the, depending on the coldness of the water, it could cause your lungs to seize and you could stop breathing at that point. I always meant to ask you that. How come you can breathe and everybody else freezes up real fast? Howard um, Rowland taught me. Howard? I saw Howard go into some real cold water and wanted me to come in after him. I didn't quite have the, uh, whatever it is, it must be that internal furnace you guys got. It's um, a polar bear club, you know, it makes you automatically able the, to stand the, the cold water. I'm thinking, I mean, I mean, really, I'm thinking of the time that uh, the case we were talking about in 82 when those poor elderly people went in and that, and that car went out in the lake a ways. And I know there was other people even from the dive team that were there that went in like up to their knees and they just, they couldn't move their legs. It was that cold. And here comes, you know, um, over the top, but I guess, you know, either, either you love the water or the cold just doesn't get to you the way it does to everybody else. It just doesn't get to me. I've always been at home in the water and the cold, uh, it, it never really seized my lungs the way it does some people. I guess for those people that was fortunate. Okay, in a couple of seconds we're going to, uh, we're going to pause for a minute and uh, we have a, a message uh, of importance from the Howell Township Police Department uh, and as soon as that public service message is over. We'll be back and uh, I think we'll start talking about these slides uh, and see some of the tips that uh, you folks at home can certainly practice uh, and possibly save someone's life or your own. Uh, Brent, I don't know how close we are to the commercial, so if... The Howell Township Police have a special drunk driving offer for you. If you drink and drive, look what you can get. You get stopped by the police and get to talk to one of our nice police officers. You get to take a test, lose your license for six months to a year. You get arrested, your car can be towed away. You get a free ride in a police car. How much does this cost you? Don't answer, there's more. You get booked, fingerprinted, the breath test. You get your picture taken. You can spend 24 hours in jail. You even get your name in the paper. Now what do you think of our offer? Fines, fees, assessments, treatment costs, 
legal bills, higher insurance rates. All this could be yours for $3,500 or more. And best of all, it's automatic, immediate, and fair. Impress your friends, family, your boss. Everyone will know you drink and drive. This offer is available on all 400 miles of Powell Roadways. Three breathalyzers and 70 operators standing by 24 hours a day. This message brought to you by the Howell Township Police, saving lives since 1971. Howell Township, where we take highway safety seriously. I want to thank uh, Chief Burkani for reminding me about that, uh, that spot. It's certainly, uh, especially in this holiday season, uh, very important for us to remember. Remember, our number here is 681-3330, 681-3330. If you have any uh, comments other than uh, screaming on the phone, we'd be uh, glad to entertain uh, some questions. Uh, getting back to my guests, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, first aid factors having to do with the cold weather. And um, as everybody knows, uh, especially uh, the us of advanced age, <clears throat> that uh, during the winter, a lot of things start happening. Uh, it seems like the joints get colder a whole lot faster, and the fingers do, and the toes. And we all know that uh, those of us who have children, that they have a tendency to stay out until uh, their fi fing yeah, fingers and feet don't work anymore, and then decide to come inside uh, and seek some warmth. So, uh, Eric, I'm going to defer this to you. Maybe you could, we could talk a little bit about some of the different um, problems associated with cold exposure and then maybe what some of the things are that we can do uh, in case it's not serious enough to call uh, the first aid or the police about. Well, the more common injuries uh, related to the cold are going to be that of frostbite. And, you know, the body maintains its heat uh, through the circulation. So the areas that are very poor with circulation, earlobes, the uh, joints, fingers, toes, uh, over the bridge of the nose and around the bone of the cheek underneath the eye, um, will freeze a lot quicker because of the fact that minimal circulation there. And uh, most people who have frostbite don't realize it. They are told they have it by somebody who can see the waxy appearance that develops because with a frostbite it freezes the nerve endings there and they just have no pain, no feeling whatsoever in that area. But um, the main thing to uh, concern yourself with is the fact that you have fluid in the cells and they freeze like ice crystals and are very sharp. So if you rub them, they uh, will cut. You have more fluid that lo you lose. Uh, there may be some bleeding and uh, the tendency is to try to rub your fingers and rub your hands to warm them up and that's really the worst thing you can do because all you're doing is making more cuts inside the skin and uh, causing more damage. So what you want to do is be very gentle um, with these areas. If it's your fingers, put them inside your coat, uh, under your armpits, a warm area. Um, for your toes, really not much you can do until you get out of the cold. Uh, and that's basically the thing to do for all of those things is get out of the cold uh, and warm up, either wrap them in uh, blankets. Um, one thing that's very good if it's a small area that's been affected, such as the hand or fingers or feet or toes, is to immerse them in warm water, approximately body temperature, a little bit warmer, 100 to 105 degrees. But somebody else should test the water because the person who is frostbitten is not going to be able to um, grade what is warm and what isn't. And what is cool to you is going to be very hot to them because of the change in sensation. Uh, so immersing in warm circulating water is very helpful. If it's large areas of the body that have been affected, arms and legs, obviously that person needs uh, medical attention. And they should not walk on the frostbitten extremity uh, and be transported to the hospital by stretcher ambulance and examine that way. How about um, maybe you could review is just uh, once again what exactly uh, frostbite looks like so that maybe somebody be able to, uh, especially those with uh, children, be able to identify that and know when there's a problem that needs to... Uh, well, it starts off as a reddening of the skin, almost like a sunburn. And uh, at that point it progresses, becomes a yellow, waxy appearance. And w when it does have that appearance, there's no feeling to that area. So you can touch yourself here and here and it feels numb. Uh, like a part of your body's asleep or no feeling at all. And uh, again, it's something that uh, other people are going to have to see. You're not going to see that yourself. And the, the warm water uh, 
portion. Uh, I know years ago they went back and forth a couple of times and didn't know if they wanted warm water and that. So uh, warm, just tepid water though, not not something that's uh, 120 or 130 no. degrees. You know, body temperature, and again, I have to emphasize that it has to be for small body areas, the, the hands and the feet. Uh, if the whole body is affected, obviously this person may lose consciousness, mm -hmm. and you put him in the water, um, and he loses consciousness in the bathtub, for instance. Uh, he may drown. You put him in the shower, uh, and he passes.